you should hear that. Um, and um, if you would like to have um, closed captions, live transcript has been enabled. So at the bottom of your screen, you should find a live transcript and you can activate that um, and let your um, uh, the closed captions appear on the bottom of the screen. Um, so uh, Carol and Justin are going to uh, do the program. Um, if you have any questions for them, please place them in the chat. Um, we have got you all muted. And so um, that should be, um, you should be able to put the questions in the chat and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Um, okay, with that, it is my very great pleasure to Sorry, I keep having to admit people. <laughs> um, I'm trying to click and talk at the same time. It's not always a good thing. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Carol Preston and Justin Hull of the Greater Farallones National Marine Sanctuary, who will be leading us on a virtual field trip to the Farallon Islands. And really looking forward to doing our virtual field trip. Um, Justin and uh, Carol, take it away. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. And I first wanted to say thank you to the environmental volunteers for all the awesome work that you've been doing and 50 years, that's a major milestone. So congratulations, that's awesome. We're actually about 50 years old too. On October 21st is our 50th, uh, beginning of our 50th anniversary year. Oh, congratulations. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> we've both been around a long time. But welcome to your Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, right uh, just beyond the Golden Gate Bridge. And we are going to go on a virtual trip today out to the islands. And we're going to be starting our journey. You can see the map here at the Marina Green in San Francisco. And that's where we'll be boarding our boat. And then um, we will head out. You can see the little green line where we're going, head out through the Golden Gate, over the fault line, and we'll probably pass some shipwrecks along the way. And then, then we'll go to the islands and they're about 20 some miles offshore. And then we're gonna go a little bit further out to the continental shelf and see what we can see. So that's our plan for today. So um, if you, before we start, this is the Marina Green and you can see that little white dot. Those white dots will be following us today throughout our, our journey. So you'll know exactly where we are. Um, and we want, we're gonna be on the Salty Lady. So welcome aboard the Salty Lady. And this is the Oceanic Society's boat and they do lots of wonderful whale watch trips out to the Farallons. And this is um, the boat we'll be on today. But you don't need to worry about having drama mean because we won't get seasick. And as we go on out uh, path towards the Golden Gate, we're going to pass our offices. And this is where Justin and I uh, work. And Justin's actually in the visitor center today, um, which is pretty cool. And we actually protect the sanctuary through research, conservation, and education programs. And we're part of a bigger system of national marine sanctuaries. There's actually 15 national marine sanctuaries and two national marine, uh, monuments around the country, kind of like our national park system, only we, we actually protect a little bit more because we're in the water. We protect 600,000 square miles of ocean. And we were just wondering if anyone's ever been to a national marine sanctuary. And if you have, maybe you can type in which one in the chat box. And we're gonna zoom, in. well, we can kind of show you some of the ones around the country. So there's some Fresh Lake ones. And then we have, uh, we'll go around the East Coast. We have Gray's Reef and Florida Keys protecting lots of beautiful coral reefs. And even one in Texas, Flower Garden Banks. And then we go all the way out to American Samoa, which is actually one of my favorite uh, sanctuaries. And then we have a uh, Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary and Papahanaumokuakea Kea in Hawaii. And then up onto the, our West Coast, we have Olympic Coast. And you can see that there are four National Marine Sanctuaries right off our coast. And that's because we are in one of the most productive areas actually in the world as far as marine life goes. So we're gonna zoom into the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. 
And this is the waters that we protect. And it's about the size of Yosemite National Park. So it's a pretty big um, body of water. And it kind of hugs the Cordell National Marine Sanctuary in the middle there, and then to the Carol, south. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. I've had yes. to say some people are saying it's a little bit out of focus. Is there? Oh, interesting. Just I can't, I, 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 Justin's driving our boat today. So <laughs> it might just be that one slide, Justin. I'm wondering if it's okay. the map. All right. We'll go to the next one and see how that looks. Okay, so um, to interrupt then. No worries. And I don't know, Hazel, can you see the chat box if anyone has been to a National Marine Sanctuary? Oh, you're muted. Hazel, you're muted. Oh, sorry. I thought I got the button. No, that's good. Um, Ruth went to one in Florida, Diane went to Hawaii, and um, Papa Wana Moa, oh, I can't pronounce that one, I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> Wisconsin Shipwreck Coast, um, um, so those are a few that people have Awesome, that's great. Well, hopefully you can all get out and explore your local ones here, since we have three right off our, our coast. All right. Well, next, we're going to cruise under the Golden Gate Bridge, and our adventure has already begun. And the rising Pacific tide surges here through this one mile narrow strait where you can see it collide with the powerful Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers. And this massive movement of all this water has gouged out these deep trenches that are at the gate. And they also deposit these rippling sand fields uh, just beyond it. And currents out here, they can move really fast. They can reach seven knots, which can make navigation kind of tricky. Uh, but this dynamic also concentrates lots and lots of fish here, which creates great foraging for porpoises and sea lions and sometimes even whales. So in this same area right at the Golden Gate is where we see lots of harbor porpoises. And you can always identify a harbor porpoise by its dorsal fin that looks like a little Hershey's kiss. And we're excited to see them here because in uh, the 1940s, when we were doing a lot of work uh, right around the World War II and shipping and protecting our port, they actually disappeared from this area. And they didn't come back for over 60 years. And they didn't come back until around 2008. And now there's actually hundreds of them. And you can see them when you're up on the Golden Gate Bridge looking down below. And that's also our research site where we uh, monitor these uh, harbor seals from today. And as we head out a little past the Golden Gate Bridge, here's the bridge here. If you look to your right, you can see the Marin Headlands. And the structure you can see is the historic Point Bonita Lighthouse. It was built in 1855 to guide boats through the treacherous Golden Gate Straits. And despite all the lighthouses along the coast, there are over 400 known shipwrecks in Greater Farallon's National Marine Sanctuary. And we have a really rich maritime heritage. If you take a closer look, kind of down by some of the rocks below the, might, the lighthouse, you might get to see some of these birds, the black oyster catcher, and these birds forage along the rocks looking for food to eat, and if you keep your eyes peeled, you might even spot a harbor seal sneaking a peek at us. All right, did you just feel that bump? We just passed over the famous San Andreas Fault. Okay, you don't really feel a bump going over the San Andreas Fault in a boat, but this is where the North American plate and the Pacific plates, uh, the tectonic plates meet, and they're very slowly creeping north. Um, the Pacific plate here is slowly creeping north at a rate of about two inches per year. And in the very distant future, very, 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 very distant future, Los Angeles will actually be San Francisco's offshore neighbor. Okay, as we uh, proceed on our journey, if you see lots of birds up ahead, a big flock, that's usually a good indication that something's happening below the surface of the water, like a big school of fish. Ooh, and you can see there's a 
looks like a whale coming up here, looks like a humpback. And maybe Justin, can you see it a little bit better on the port side of the boat? Yeah, check out these whales. So to communicate, humpback whales sing and they slap the surface of the water. See that slapping going on right now? Whoa. And the patterns on the underside of their tails can make it possible to identify individual whales just like a human fingerprint. And with one of the longest migrations of any animal, humpback whales travel through many of our national marine sanctuaries. And these special places our sanctuaries give whales safe places they need to feed and to raise their young. Ooh, it looks like we uh, captured some nice photos today. You can see that big breach of the humpback. And if you look closely, you can see all those pleats in the front there. And that's um, kind of an amazing adaptation where they can swallow almost a whole school of fish and those pleats expand to accommodate that. And you can see their long pectoral fins. Those are the ones on the side. They use those to steer as they go through the water as well as to corral fish and to communicate. Um, they actually have a pretty advanced system of communication through physical uh, movements as well as sound. And we're just really beginning to understand how they do communicate. All right, well, and here's our next stop. We're coming up on the spot where in 1953, the freighter SS Jacob Lukenbach collided Here's the Lukenbach with its sister ship, the Hawaiian pilot, and it sank 17 miles off of San Francisco. Thankfully, no lives were lost, but here's a view of the shipwreck. Decades later, we're having these mystery oil spills during severe winter storms that were harming thousands of seabirds and marine mammals. And so our Farallon's Beach Watch volunteers started collecting evidence, and they were able to trace these leaks to the Lukenbach shipwreck. So back in 2002, a multi-agency group removed over 100,000 gallons of fuel off of this shipwreck, and the leaks during those winter storms dropped dramatically, successfully preventing more wildlife harm. Uh, and I'm going to show you a little sonar sweep here. This is a sweep of the Lukenbox bow, and it shows the split between the stern and the main hull. Uh, this is a sonar image on the bottom of the ocean. Oh, look, there's the hula cat. That's a sport fishing boat. And Justin, it might be fun if we could radio over, try to get Tom Matouche, who's the captain, and see how they're doing out there today. All right, let's see if Tom's available. Hello, I'm Tom Matouche of Hooli Cat Sport Fishing. We offer the best possible fishing adventure to our clients with a crew trained in responsible fishing practices who are always there to help. Salmon, rockfish, Dungeness crab, albacore, research trips, we do it all and we do it right. As a Harbor Commissioner, I promote sustainability and as part of the Dungeness Crab Task Force Whale Entanglement Group, help prevent whale entanglement and crab gear. Count on us for a great day at sea. Fun. Fishing is always a, a good way to go out and enjoy the sanctuary. And if you like to eat fish, um, it's always good to buy local fish. That's usually the most sustainable types of fish that you can eat. And one of them that's not a fish, it's actually a crab, the Dungeness crab is many of our favorites and is one of our most sustainable uh, seafoods that we can eat. And Justin is gonna show us one that we have at the visitor center today. All right, uh, I'm gonna spotlight myself for everyone. Everybody can see me okay? So I have a model of one of our beautiful Dungeness crabs uh, that many of you know about, and this is one of our favorites to eat for those of us who eat crab. And if you look on the underside here, you can tell this one has a little triangle on the bottom. That's a male crab. Only the male crabs are allowed to be uh, caught and kept in the fisheries. And uh, just because it's fun and I'm in the visitor center, does everybody want to see a real live crab, like a wiggly rock crab? 
Yeah, I see a couple nods out there in, uh, in Zoom land. Okay, first you need your towel so you don't take out your computer. We got a dripping live crap. This one was really kind of fierce like this morning. So wish me luck. I'll be back with a live crab here. They're very strong. It's a little smaller than our Dungeness crab that I was just showing you, but this is a live rock crab. You can tell by those black tips on the tips of its claws. Uh, people do eat these. You see people fishing for them on some of the public piers, especially. And you can see this one has a big kind of like a beehive. I got to be careful around these claws. Um, <laughs> this telson underneath here has like a big beehive shape. And this one's a female crab. And right underneath that, um, that telson is where she would brood thousands Rock crabs can even have like up to like a million teeny tiny eggs. So I think that's pretty incredible. And uh, I'm gonna tuck this one back into my bucket here, but I'll teach you guys a real quick activity. It's a good stretch for a Saturday morning called the Mommy Crabby Dance. And it's pretty easy. You ready? If I were you, I'd turn on my camera if it's not on, but this is fun. All right, everybody give me thumbs up. All right, check that out. That's pretty good. Let's see if you can do it a little faster. Everybody had their coffee? Who's a coffee drinker? All right, on your marks, get set. Give me thumbs up. Oh, that was better. Thumbs inside. Fingers out with your fingers stuck together. And you have two really nice crab claws. And you're going to use those crab claws to grab some food. So if you're underwater, glue, 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 get your crab mentality on. Here comes some food drifting by. You're going to grab it with your claws and stuff it in your mouth. And then... You also can use those to defend yourself like that crab was that I was when I was getting it out of the tank this morning. And if something comes, it wants to eat you, maybe like a seagull comes and you're in some rocks, you're going to, I'm going to say seagull. I want you to put your crab claws up. Seagull, protect yourself. Oh, you're going to get eaten if you don't protect yourself. Hazel, I think you got eaten by a seagull. Oh no. Okay. Get those claws up. You can protect yourself. All right. Excellent. Now we're going to take one finger and we're going to draw that big semicircle on our tummy. And let's see who can get the most eggs. All right. We're going to lay some eggs and we're going to stick them underneath that telson. So let's go and put like 10 eggs down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Uh, let's see if we can do more like a hundred. See, you can get the highest number here. Who is the most fecund? All right. Let's see if we can get like a million eggs. All right. Go, 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 go. Awesome. All right, that's a lot of eggs. Okay, now we're gonna protect our egg. Oh, seagulls, two seagulls. Pinch one of them, get the seagull behind you. Oh, that was close. And then we're gonna just, last bit here, we're gonna take care of our eggs by using those walking legs to kind of poke the eggs and move oxygen through it. So we're poking, we're poking, we're poking. Oh, seagull, protect yourself. And we're poking, we're poking. Whew. It is tough work being a mama crab. Good Saturday morning workout and our eggs are ready to hatch. We're gonna do one last thing to oxygenate the eggs called the big flush. Thumbs up, thumbs inside. Fingers out with your fingers stuck together. And we're gonna move our arms like that and flap our telson at the same time. So it kind of looks like this. Yeah, pretty good. You guys gotta cut it down. All right, and our oxygenated babies are ready to hatch off. Millions of brothers and sisters that are probably never going to see each other again are going to go drifting off into the ocean uh, and repopulate the, the ocean with lots and lots of crabs. And we're going to just wave bye bye to our babies. So show me your claw. We're going to wave bye to our babies as they drift off. Bye, babies. Get luck. Good luck. There's about a million of you. Probably just a handful of you might survive to adulthood, but good luck. It's a weird reproductive strategy, but I'm committed to it. Bye, babies. Everybody give their babies one last wave and we'll get back to our virtual program. Thanks everybody for doing the mommy crabby dance and checking out our live dripping crab this morning. So we have a visitor center up uh, near Golden Gate Bridge and it will probably reopen in January. So hopefully you can all come up and visit us then. All right, is that coming through okay again, Carol? Are we back on our- yes. But I think, uh, yeah, and we're ready to move forward. All right. 
There we go. Oh, nice, Justin. We're uh, coming up on a beautiful common myrrh. That's almost like one of our, for us, our penguin. Uh, it's not really a penguin, but it is a beautiful seabird. And there are about 150,000 of them out on the Farallons. And they nest and breed there. And they lay one egg, which I do have a replica egg here, if you can see that. Um, from the visitor center. And both parents take care of the chick when it hatches, the female and the male. And then in about two weeks, the female is exhausted. She's put in so much energy to that egg and feeding that she takes off. And then it's the dad that teaches the little chick how to swim and hunt and find its food. And when they're about as big as that little cute fledgling down there, before they can even fly, they hop down the steep cliffs of the island and jump into the water. And that all happens in July and August. You can often see them out on the water during that time. Oh, nice. This is another uh, whale watching boat. So if you ever decide to go out to the Farallons, there's many options here in San Francisco that you can take, but this is the kitty cat. Um, through the San Francisco whale tours. And it's always good to make sure that you select a vendor that um, is very careful of wildlife, that they don't disturb wildlife, but also give you a great educational experience on your way out. Ooh, and here's another kind of seabird, a tufted puffin. So puffins have these huge bright orange bills in breeding season and these long feathery plumes that decorate their heads and their beaks can hold up to 20 small fish crosswise. So mostly they're fishing for sardines or anchovies. Sometimes you'll even see them holding squid and they fly underwater kind of like dive bombers and they can chase their prey all the way down to about 200 feet. And currently there are about 120 puffins that call the Farallon Islands home and they nest really deep inside tunnels and crevices in the island's rocky slopes. Hey Justin, there's this really odd looking fish up at the surface kind of flapping around and it almost looks like it's missing its tail. Do you know what that is? Oh, Carol, I think you just spotted one of my favorite things to see out here. Looks like we found an ocean sunfish or a mola mola. Let's see if we can take a closer look. All right, we'll meet the mola mola. Wow. Mola mola are also known as ocean sunfish for their habit of lying flat on the surface of the ocean in order to be warmed by the sun. And they are a pelagic fish. They can grow up to 5,000 pounds. That's heavier, heavier than your typical SUV. And these bony fish are sometimes even seen in schools. And as they get older, they become more solitary. Oh, we made it to the Farallon Islands. This is actually one of the most exclusive neighborhoods in San Francisco because only eight people at a time can stay overnight uh, at the Farallons. And it's usually the researchers that are out there and they stay in those two little houses that you see that were the lighthouse keepers houses way back. And the lighthouse on the top up there was built in 1855. Ooh, nice. This is a great arch rock. Lots of rock formations as you sail around the islands. And I wanted to show you a little map because we're going to be getting off onto the islands and we're going to go where that red writing is. That's called East Landing. But there are actually two islands here uh, right next to each other. There's the main island that I don't know if we can, yeah, there we go. We can kind of show you that. Um, and then that's the Southeast Farallon Island. And then that's where we do most of our research. And then there's the West End Island. And that is mostly reserved for wildlife. Although we do go over there once and now and again, and they're separated in by the Jordan Channel. So there's a channel of water between the two.
And when we go out there, we're usually on that silver boat there that's called the Full Mar. That's the sanctuary research boat. And we're greeted then by that orange zodiac that uh, belongs to the Fish and Wildlife Service. And they come out and pick us up off the silver boat. And then they shuttle us over to the Billy Poo. And then you have to kind of climb onto that thing. And then you hold on, it's called the Billy Poo, and they bring you up and onto the islands. And all of our gear uh, comes on that way as well. And when we land, we're no longer in the National Marine Sanctuary. The National Marine Sanctuary goes up to the high tide line, the mean high tide line. And uh, once you're on land, you're actually on the Farallon National Wildlife Refuge. And there's also another organization that's been out there for over 50 years, and that's the Point Blue Conservation Science. And they've been studying elephant seals and seabirds and even their salamanders and crickets that are out there. Um, and I wanted to introduce you to one of our uh, researchers out there. His name is Ryan Berger. The pace of life out here slows down quite a bit. We're examining things so closely and you just, you start to understand the animals. And that's kind of neat when you get that involved with a study species because you feel like you've become part of, you know, their world. Pinnipeds, which are seals and sea lions, they are top marine predators. They are a reliable source to indicating the health of an ecosystem. With respect to climate change, this is where the value of long-term data sets comes in. You know, the island has been impacted quite a bit from climate change. We've seen sea level rise as a part of this whole increase in the intensity and frequency of large storm events. We have had a lot of sand erosion washing away beach access areas and the beaches themselves, and our elephant seal population has declined as a result. We've been collecting sea surface temperature with that long-term weather data set over time, and we've seen increases in, in recording some of the highest sea surface temperatures that we've ever gotten. This is such a complicated ecosystem, right? We don't know that much about our oceans. So uh, the Farallon Islands actually are the largest seabird rookery in the contiguous United States. So we're able to do lots of seabird research there. And our research usually begins uh, pre-dawn and goes until it's dark. And we, it consists of mist netting and banding and recording uh, and measuring and just general health checks of all the different uh, seabirds that are there. And this is one that we're super lucky to see today because it's usually out at night. It's a nocturnal seabird. And this is the rhinoceros auklet. And they, uh, similar to the pot, well, kind of like the puffin, but they, um, burrow in cavities. So they actually dig uh, for their nesting sites on the islands. And they are given their name by that little horn that you can see, yeah, on their bill there. And during breeding season, it turns a bright blue green and glows at night, which is kind of a cool thing to see. And sometimes we see birds on the Farallon Islands that aren't normally seen there like this northern gannet. It's actually an ocean uh, seabird from the Atlantic and it arrived in 2012 and likes it there evidently and has never left. So besides all of the seabirds that are on the islands, we also have lots of pinnipeds. So that's seals and sea lions and the islands are just covered with birds and pinnipeds at the same time. And let's go meet some of them. Oh, there's a nice uh, elephant seal. And by the way, that elephant seal does not have a cold. That white fluffy stuff there um, is actually a good sign. It's a sign of a very healthy, well hydrated seal. And then this is a northern fur seal, which is really a nice uh, success story because they were really hunted almost, well, actually to extinction on the islands. But then in 1996, one seal pup was born. And now every summer there's about 2000 seal pups born. So they've really made a strong comeback out there. 
And this is our California sea lion, which I bet almost all of you are very familiar with. They're the ones that we see barking and making lots of noise close to shore, as well as out on the islands. And then this beautiful one is our largest seal. This is our stellar sea lion, and they are still a little bit threatened. They haven't made such a strong comeback as the northern fur seal, but you can see that large bull there, that's the male. And they actually have a mane. That's where they kind of get their uh, name. Plus they roar just like a real uh, sea lion. So they're fun to see out there. And then the sanctuary, we also uh, go out, the sanctuary staff go out at least twice a year to the Farallon Islands to monitor the rocky intertidal uh, sites that we have. And that's where the land meets the sea. And we've been doing that for about 20 years. We have a really great data set that really informs us how our, our world is changing. And here's one of my uh, favorite uh, rocky intertidal monitoring spots out there. The tide pools out there are just gorgeous. And you can see the deep pools that we have on the, in the rocky shore there and huge mussel beds and all that green algae that's there. And we uh, put out these, those quadrats that you can see, those white quadrats. And they're randomly put out and we do count the invertebrates that are in there as well as the seaweed um, and monitor, as I mentioned, twice a year. And just the, the variety of life, the biodiversity in the uh, tide pools out there is just incredible and beautiful, like this wonderful hydroid. And so colorful, the tide pools are so colorful. You can see the purple urchins and the orange sponge and the little anemones that are closed up and that beautiful pink coralline algae. And they have giant green anemones out on the Farallons. This is not actually a flower, it's an animal and they use their tentacles to catch their food and then they put it in their mouth there in the center and they can live over 150 years. So they're a very long lived organism. And uh, I wanted to show you, we mostly we do all of our monitoring, as I mentioned, on the main Southeast Farallon Island. We have six uh, tide pool monitoring spots, but there is one over on the West End. And I wanted to show you how we get across to monitor that site, because it's kind of a fun, exciting little way to get across that channel. So you get in a harness and you push off, it's called a zip line, and you get to the other side and that's how you do it. And this is Taylor and she makes it look super easy. It, it's not really that easy for me, <laughs> although very fun and exciting. Okay, now we're gonna head out a little bit beyond uh, the Farallon Islands. And as we leave the islands, the underwater area is just really beautiful and colorful. This is a really uh, beautiful uh, greenling that you can see this fish, but all the rocky uh, outcrops in that area are just covered in life, in cor corals and anemones and sponges. And sometimes, um, in that area. This is a good place to spot the giant Pacific octopus. Uh, this is our largest octopus that we have and the longest lived, although they still only live about three to five years. And just like all octopuses, they do camouflage and change the texture of their skin to match um, their habitat. This one was taken by surprise a little bit by our underwater camera, so it didn't change colors yet. And as we keep going out, I just wanted to let people know that because it's so kind of gray and blue at the top of the surface of the water, but underneath it's just beautiful gardens, like underwater gardens of sponges and corals and just it's life on top of life. So a very, very rich area that we have. Ooh, and here we have our famous white shark. 
So I want everybody to stop for a moment and pause because you've been hearing lots of talking and take a deep breath because I want you to really think about this. This is kind of cool. I mean, the Farallon Islands are within the same zip code as the Richmond District in San Francisco. And yet they host the, one of the largest, most significant populations of white sharks in the world every fall. And it's the big females that come back. Every other year they come back and they come back to the exact same place, their exact territory that they mark. And they can live to be about 70 years old. Um, and then the males also come back in this area, but it's the females that stake the territory around the islands. Anybody know how old uh, the average age of male sharks are? You can uh, put it, I guess, in the chat box if you do know. And we'll check that at the end. Um, We'll give everybody a minute. It's uh, 50 years. So, which is both very long lived fish. Okay, and past the Farallon Islands, about 30 miles offshore, now we're at the edge of our continental shelf at the Farallon's escarpment. So, right here, that seafloor plunges down a steep escarpment to over 6,500 feet. And uh, together that south flowing California current and the earth's rotation and our spring winds, they force cold nutrient rich waters to come up against the escarpment to the surface. And this is what we call upwelling. And here's uh, where sunlight triggers photosynthesis and the tiny sea plants, the phytoplankton, um, just kind of goes, the populations of phytoplankton just go crazy. And there's like exponential growth of phytoplankton that acts as the bottom of the food web. And it just puts the whole food web into overdrive. And the super abundance of food attracts dolphins, sperm whales, fur seals, and the largest animal on earth, our blue whale. So here's a view of what that escarpment looks like. Here are the Farallon, Southeast Farallon Islands. Here's the continental shelf. And here is the deeper waters coming off of the escarp uh, escarpment. Whoa. All right, if we're looking ahead, we flying low across the waves towards us is a black footed albatross. It has a little leg tag that tells us that this albatross has flown thousands of miles from Northwest Hawaiian islands to forage here on our, in our sanctuary for squid, fish eggs and crustaceans that it's gonna bring back to its chick on the nest in Hawaii. So July and August are the peak season for hungry chicks and it really keeps those parents busy flying to and from Hawaii to our rich waters right off of California. Scientists have tracked these albatross flying more than 6,000 miles round trip in just a few weeks. And with uh, something called dynamic soaring, they can half sleep while they're on the wing and cruise at over 80 miles per hour. Wow, that's a treat. And we are going to end our adventure today with the largest creature ever to live on earth, which is the mighty blue whale. And after past intensive hunting, they're still endangered, but our sanctuaries are working to protect them from modern day threats. Now the blue whales near exclusive food are these tiny shrimp like krill. And here they can eat up to four tons of it, four tons of these little krill per day. One year we saw 47 blue whales gathered near the spot just for a huge seafood feast. And it's a great indicator of just how productive our sanctuary can be. And it's rare that a place can support so many of these apex predators uh, at the top of the food chain, such as blue whales and white sharks. And it's why Greater Farallon's National Marine Sanctuary exists and why we need to help keep protecting it. Hey, Justin, well, okay. Um, so this is uh, right about now, once we're at the continental shelf is when most people start falling asleep on a real trip because they've been out in that long, you know, ocean air and, um, 
usually sunny, hopefully, and they're just worn out with all the bumping. It's usually a pretty bumpy trip. Um, but we would really like for you to kind of reflect about all the wildlife that you saw today. And you can uh, put your questions in the chat box and we will be answering those momentarily. But also um, we wanted you to recognize how fragile these sanctuaries really are and how important they are to wildlife and they need your protection. The decisions that you make when you shop, travel and vote really do uh, make a difference to our marine life. Okay, I think we'll go straight to the uh, Q&A. So um, before we do, Carol and Justin, that was wonderful. Um, I'm glad you were totally unaware of the frantic um, of my computer completely freezing. And so I want to, <laughs> I want to apologize to everybody who is trying to get in and um, I hope you got in. We will have a recording hopefully to share with everyone and um, uh, hopefully it's resolved. And we have, um, Anyway, so um, I'm going to keep my video off because I clearly don't have the bandwidth right now. <laughs> um, so let's go to uh, Q&A. And um, I was just looking through the chat. Has anyone got any questions they would like to? Or we can remove, um, if you want to use the reactions, I can unmute everybody, um, hopefully. And you can, um, you should all now be able to unmute yourselves if you would like to ask a question. Try putting your hand up first though. Anybody? Looks like Maria uh, has a question. Yeah, um, I just put this in the chat too. What I was just wondering the when you're talking about the phytoplankton, um, if there's a time of year, a specific time of year when that really blooms and when you see a big increase in wildlife. Uh, yes, I guess do you, uh, you want, uh, Justin's really our plankton guy. He loves plankton, um, but it, it is in the spring during the upwelling season. That is when we have our giant blooms and it's really when our ocean turns green and when it turns that green color, you really know it's full of plankton. Yeah, that's, it's great. I mean, you can find phytoplankton year round, of course, but you were asking about when the big blooms happen and it's when those winds are howling in the spring and that drives the upwelling. And it's not necessarily just one straight season. It kind of like happens and then it relaxes and then it happens again, which is all part of the system. But yeah, exactly what Carol said. Okay. Um, some questions from the chat. There's, uh, Lois asks, what is the website for booking the fishing and watching and crabbing? And do you have in-person programs? Yeah, um, I can start with the in-person programs. We definitely have in-person programs, but they are not happening yet. We still haven't kind of been released from lockdown. So we're still doing virtual programs. It would be wonderful if we could be doing in-person programs next year. But I also feel like we've been saying that for a while. Um, when we are open for in-person programs, we do family workshops, uh, but usually at least one a month up at our visitor center in the Presidio in San Francisco. And we definitely have a crabbing program um, that's kind of focused on for families. Um, and we do, yeah, all kinds of in-person public programs like Sharktoberfest every year in the fall, uh, the last, usually the last Saturday in September. And we do soirees uh, in person as well. Um, we're doing them virtually now. We have one coming up on November 6th. That's our deep sea soiree that's gonna be a virtual program. Um, but we often do those in person when we can. And Carol, did you wanna, add or um... sure we also do a month when we're open as justin mentioned um we do monthly excursions so those are awesome and we go out once a month to some place in the sanctuary 
Um, and we either kayak or hike or take a boat um, to see certain things that are happening at certain times of the year. And when we go to the Farallons, it's usually in July, August or the fall when it's calmer waters. But there's amazing trips. There's um, trips to see the bioluminescence in Tomales Bay that you go out on a kayak at night and it's phenomenal and there's tide pooling trips. So definitely encourage you uh, to join us for those. And then um, as far as I think the question was about fishing and, and or going out on a whale watch boat, we have many different vendors. We actually don't, uh, we actually just hire them as well when we do a trip. So I recommend that you go out and see some of them. Um, the Hula Cat boat uh, that you saw in the program, um, is definitely one of the ones that, you know, does sustainable fishing that we recommend. But there are many others. Okay, so another question that is here is um, Bill and Mari ask, what is the depth of the shipwreck? The depth of, um, of uh, the, the Lukenbach? I'm, yes, I think so. It was um, from, I, it doesn't say specifically, but yeah. Is Mar are Mari and Bill still on here? Would they like to unmute themselves? No, I can't see them. Okay. Hey, Justin, I'm just wondering if um, we could change not sharing the screen because then we could yeah. see the That'd people be great. Sure. asking the questions. Oh. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. And then I just need to change my format, I guess. I forgot how to do that, but I'll, I'll figure it out. I never it's up at the top on the right side. Oh yeah, I remember now. Sorry. Just okay. I'll, I'll see. I'll see if I can. I'll see if I can track down the depth of the Lukenbach too. Okay, uh, Maria, do you have a question, or is is that just left from you? Uh, no, I just forgot to take it down. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Um, Leslie wrote a question. Uh, how does the public demand for krill oil affect the marine life food supply? Oh. For crude oil? Is that what you listen? Krill, krill oil. krill oil. Oh, krill oil. Oh, that's a very good question. Um, you know, I, I think on a good year, on a good upwelling year, not, it doesn't. Uh, so right now there's just so much krill that in our region, and there's not that much uh, harvesting of the krill oil in our region. So I don't know about other regions around the world. Um, it, it's okay, but we definitely monitor that. Yeah, the, the uh, what I've heard is that they've, they're kind of slowly moving to more and more remote places to harvest krill as people are starting to put more protections in since it's such an important forage food. I found the depth of the, uh, of the Jacob Lukenbach. It sank in uh, 50 meters, so 53 meters of water, so about 176 oh, okay. feet. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm looking for more questions. Yeah, anybody else? Any questions? You can unmute yourself and ask them. Oh, uh, well, Diane had a, uh, a comment. It is so crazy how far the albatross has to travel to feed its chicks. Uh, absolutely. Yes, it is really amazing. All the way from the Hawaiian Islands, which just shows you how rich and productive this area is, that they actually make that journey just to get the food and then fly all the way back to feed their chicks. And so the male, you know, the male and the female, they take turns taking that long journey and bringing the food back. How, how long does it take them to fly that? Um, Usually about that is... around three weeks. Three weeks, wow. Yeah. There's a lot of animals that come to this area just to feed. So we have the leatherback sea turtle comes all the way from Indonesia and the blue whales that Justin showed you, they come all the way up from Costa Rica and just, it, it really is quite amazing. Um, at the comments, any more questions, anybody? Okay. All right. Um, 
uh, have you, Justin, Carol, have you anything else to add? Or um, like, I think um, looks like, um, unfortunately, I missed most of it. <laughs> I'm so well, I sorry. I'm so glad. Actually, I'm glad nobody else noticed in the background because um, it was really quite furious. I had all kinds of things going on trying to get back up online. Um, so my apologies again to those who got left in the waiting room. I think there were two or three people. Um, I really I can see you were there, but I, nothing was working. Um, I apologize for that. Um, the recording will be made available and it just remains for me to, and I'm going to be watching the recording because I missed a lot of it. <laughs> um, I, I got somewhere out past the shipwreck and then I crashed, unfortunately. Oh. Um, so, but anyway, don't worry, we, we're all here. Um, and uh, I want to thank Justin and Carol for their amazing presentation. And um, Please, if you want to see any of our other programs that are going on with the environmental volunteers, check out our website um, on uh, evols.org. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. The weather is gorgeous. Um, I hope you enjoy it. All right. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank Thanks you. for sharing the morning with us. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I enjoyed the All information. Right. Thank you, Gail. Thanks for Thank coming. You. I got I got cut off, but oh yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye. I'm trying to pull you back in. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, all right, folks. We're just waiting. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording now. There we go.